I'm Jan Daly, I'm the Arts Editor of the Financial Times, and I'm really delighted to be here talking to Rachel Feinstein. Today we're going to call this session Fantasy and Darkness, although in fact it's very difficult to find a single phrase that sums up Rachel's work because it's so rich and so multiple and there are so many facets to it. Um, I think that if we, if we, if I started even to talk about the range of your influences, whether it's um, everything from the religious to fairy tales to um, uh, to the late Gothic to uh, candy stores to just about everything that we can imagine in art history and in everyday life. And there's something of all of that in, that makes up this wonderful um, potpourri that is your work and your influences. So I hope we'll be able to talk about some of them. I think we're gonna start with um, an image from um, a very recent show, which is called Mirror. Um, so would you like to start by sure. Thank talking you. Thank about, you for having me here. about this? Very happy to talk about Mirror. Um, it was a sh my most recent show that was in London, um, and I had been living in um, a small farmhouse during COVID, and I, it was a response to the feeling of isolation, and I think that we're going to start seeing a whole new world of art and writing and music and books that are just starting to trickle out about what it felt like to also be a woman and a mother um, in a situation that in the old days you would have been much more used to than now. And I, you know, without any help, without, with children and, and a lot of things all kind of being put onto um, my shoulders when I was used to being able to go to my studio and having time to myself. And um, I had been a religion and philosophy major at college and I always loved art, but my family for some reason didn't see art as being a profession, but a religion and philosophy major could be. I don't know how that works out, but, um, and I was interested in fairy tales and um, why a fairy tale would be a story, especially a story that a young girl would be affected by and, um, and think about, but then an Old Testament story would be the law or the rule or the way things had to be. And um, so I particularly was interested in Sleeping Beauty and I wrote my thesis about it and that started this whole long history of, of that. And so, um, I, during COVID, I did something that I always wanted to do, which I started Jungian psychoanalysis, which was a big dream, and I never had time to do it. And through this unconscious dream analysis, I started to look at religious images, and my father was Jewish, my mother was Catholic, so this is coming from a background of just using images as icons and as archetypes. It's not from the point of view of the actual religion that I'm speaking from. It's about the image of, of Mary being a mother and Jesus being her child and suffering and showing suffering through a universal language that has existed before Christianity, before Judaism, and all different religions of the same type of image. And so I, um, I was really lost and I felt very um, confused after having been isolated um, for so long and feeling that the world was never going to be the same and how would making art matter at this point. So getting back to New York, I had a hard time trying to make something happen in my studio and I went back to looking at the old masters, in particular Tillman Reimenschneider, who was a German Gothic sculptor from the 1500s and um, Hans Baldung Green also who was the contemporary and um, assistant to Durer was another one that spoke to me and strangely I didn't realize this but Jungian stuff is about opposites everything's about this duality of our world and how 
man needs woman and light needs dark and sun needs moon and there's this and subconscious needs consciousness and so the middle sculpture that we're looking at right now is of a Hans Baldung green image that's a flat two-dimensional drawing um, and I turned it into a three-dimensional sculpture and then the paintings that are on mirrors were of from sculptures, from three-dimensional limewood sculptures, but I made them into two-dimensional paintings. And I did not do that consciously, which is what's also very strange. And so the mirrors are, are specifically made to basically be looking at you. There are no eyes on the saints and the icons so that when you are standing close to them, your eyes become their eyes. And, um, and it was actually a very, powerful show for me because it was a realization of a lot of things I think I've been thinking about for a very long time and having the quiet of COVID actually was I was able to bring them out into the light and that's um a, that's a very nice thing but it's also hard you know because I I think using religious imagery is a very difficult um, thing to do um, in, in the contemporary life and also in the contemporary art world. Um, and I had done a show previously before this, my first survey show at the Jewish Museum in New York City, where I had seen a sculpture of a crucifixion that I made right after September 11th. And that's what basically brought about the religious kind of iconography again, because when I made that sculpture, I had a writer named Stephen Vincent came to interview me about it and he said, why did you make that crucifixion sculpture? And I was pregnant for the first time and I, in September 11th had happened and I just said, I don't know, I, I can't tell you. And he wrote this beautiful essay about it and it was about how contemporary artists have a hard time just embracing the, the iconography that has existed and instead of making fun of it and, and it's been, this thing within me where I actually was embarrassed that I was using these images myself. And I, I, I fought it for a long time and I asked my Jungian therapist about it and I said, why, why is it? And she said that the interesting thing is is that your unconscious identifies with these images very, very strongly, but your conscious is your ego. and, and and it, you're embarrassed by it because your ego is embarrassed by it. And, and so it was just it, how I was, I was somehow being able to let go of my ego and just allow myself to, to present these images. But, but it's not something that I think a lot of people instantly want to go deep on. They instantly see, oh, it's, a, it's Mother, you know, Mary and Jesus, or it's Magdalene, and it's, it's it's very hard to allow your ego to embrace those images that have list, like, lasted for thousands of years, not just in Christianity. So I think that what I was trying to allow myself to do, which I'm hoping other people will get as well, is that we've been here before. We've lived in this world as humans for a very, very long time. And when you're in a cycle of your own lifespan, you kind of don't want to think about what came before you because it makes you feel obviously your own mortality and your own sense of, um, of smallness. But I think contemporary life, especially with um, social media, has really erased the fact that we have been here a long time and we keep making the same mistakes, we keep doing the same things over and over again. And if we can learn from the past and identify ourselves within these historical, like, you know, primitive imagery that has existed since the beginning of time in cave drawings, perhaps we will learn and we'll stop doing the same things, which we are obviously now in with the Ukraine right now. So it's just, it's, it's you know, there's, there's a lot to learn from the past and, and that's why I basically embraced these images that were coming to me very strongly and I kept saying every time I come home from the studio, I'm like, why am I doing this? What's wrong with me? And I just had to do it. I had to keep going. So, so this is one of the, um, the, show, the images and then this was a close up so you could see the eyes of the paintings and you could see how um, the, the sculpture 
is, is stained wood, and the paintings look like they're stained wood, but they're, they're oil paint, actually, right onto the mirror. And they look like they've been carved out. So there's this experience of your body um, when you're looking at the sculpture. Sculpture itself is also um, more of the matter and of the body, and the painting is more of the spirit and of the soul. So you have this weird experience just in there yourself. Um, as, as a dual being, if that makes sense. Yes, it, it absolutely does. They're incredibly powerful. And also what I get from these is that they resonate with your interest in, in fairy tale and yes. with witches yes. and uh, witchcraft. There's a sense of creatures of the woods yes. because they think, you know, they seem so much like woods. So even though yes. your primary um, illusion is yes. to the religious images. There are also these pagan yes. images. They're very fiercely um, images from a, a kind of, well, the sort of uh, what you might call the dark side of religion. Yes, and that's the thing with this, the witches. The witches actually began the whole show. So um, I've always loved Hans Baldung Green, and he's famous for basically being the first artist in art history to present sexy witches, to actually use the iconography of, of like a witch's Sabbath with like, you know, fire and naked women around, um, you know, a, a cauldron and dead babies and cats and people flying on broomsticks. Supposedly he was the first person to do this. And when he was um, starting to sell art, it was the beginning of the, um, you know, the printed the first time there you could do mass printed Bibles in the Gutenberg Bible and then supposedly the second most popular um, printed book was this one about how to kill witches and it was this turning of historically of understanding that midwives and and women who were healers and women who would live in the woods and collect herbs to take care of you were all of a sudden seen as the other and as 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 um, Maleficent and not the movie Maleficent, Malif Malifilis or whatever, but this, I, I, now I'm like trying to remember the word with my Disney connection, but it's so funny how my, your brain works now. And, um, and so I think that I became very interested in the symbol of these women and what they meant to me now um, and how they're considered the original kind of artists in a lot of ways where they were allowed to live in this free state outside of the confines of, of their social structure as women versus men who were pretty much allowed to do whatever they wanted in, in a more general sense of the word. And women witches were allowed to kind of live free. And so I, I really like this image of them as being these free wild creatures and that the men were the ones that were stuck in this, in this square, passively watching what was happening to the women creating this, fierce, this fierceness. But it's also the idea that both elements are needed to balance the world. If you let those women rule, they would be destructive in one way, and if you let those men rule, they would be destructive in the opposite way. So they need each other to join to balance out their powers. And, um, and another thing about the witches that I found quite fascinating is that Baldung, Hans Baldung Green, actually was a true intellectual of the era and, and was friends with Martin Luther, I, I, I've been told, and, and had a lot of very smart people that were his friends. And he, he created this image of these sexy witches on purpose to sell his art. And so he was the first, I mean, Durer, who was his master, who was his teacher, was the first global worldwide famous artist by selling all of his prints. And he became somebody that people in Spain knew, people in England knew, even though he lived in Germany. And so Hans Baldung Green learned from him and learned that he had to basically come up with some shtick to make his money and his thing was sexy witches, you know, which was <laughs> kind of to the detriment of real witches as it turns out though, you know, yeah.
I love the idea that he might have invented the broomstick. Yes, <laughs> <That's pretty laughs> it good. is amazing, isn't it? <laughs> it yeah. is. Um, so, Rachel, take us back a little bit. You've mentioned something about your parents. So your father was Jewish, your mother Catholic. Yes. Um, so you were exposed to two sets of I was. iconography. As and I was it were. very confused. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, but so it's very rich, even if very confusing yes. for a child. And also, you grew up in Florida, in Miami. Yes. Yes. And we were talking earlier, and you made yeah. that sound like a kind of fantasy land as it well. Was. It I was. I mean, an extraordinary place of that was That's almost true. unreal and had lots of fantastical elements it to it. It completely was unreal. I mean, I... I tell people this story and they still don't believe it, but I, I mean, I would go swimming in the swimming hole that my friends um, lived around. And one day um, we, I was on a canoe and I mean, it was just a lawless, crazy place. And I was on this canoe and I felt on the canoe, you, know, you could feel the reeds underneath your feet. Cause it's, and I felt this bumps and I was like, hmm, I wonder what that is. And then I got out and I said, I think there's an alligator in here with us. And we all went out very calmly, and we told one of the parents, and the parents said, our dog has been missing all week. And then someone else said, a cat's been missing. And then they called the animal wildlife guy, and he comes down, and he brings this big frozen turkey, like throws it in with a hook in it, and he's like, I'll be back in a week. And sure enough, he pulls out this huge alligator, like gigantic, and, and, and my, you know, there's iguanas that live in my mom's backyard that are like, the huge that are gigantic and my cat would eat them and throw up the head at dinner and then and, and my dad is, was a doctor and he would not believe in taking the cats and dogs to the vet so my cat had like some crazy goiter and he just cut open the cat's goiter and like just like a very uh, uh, insane and then there was also Miami Beach you know from the Scarface era I was around 14 like when I first started going out and doing the nightclub scene down there, and it was it was unreal. It was I mean we would go out and there would be there's the smallest man in the world. He was about this tall and he was put on a topless woman's shoulder at a nightclub and they had this act and then he she would put him on a table and then he'd do the moon dance and then we'd all go skinny dipping and we would have all of our clothes stolen. And I would have to hide behind a car and try to find a payphone and call my mom to bring the keys and like to the car and and it was it was really lawless. My dad was a dermatologist and he'd be paid in 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 cash in these big satchels of cash. And Manuel Noriega was his patient and and um, and there was really um, it was but there was an incredible freedom because no one seemed to be watching and no one cared, you know? And it was, um, so I, I have this theory that, and I'm sure a lot of people have this theory, but that all artists, all writers, all filmmakers, everybody are just basically just recreating that those very formative years, you know, that whole um, kind of, what's the name of that movie, Stand By Me, that movie that, you know, the, the book, and also that you have something happen to you when you're between 12 and 15 or that you visually identify with something that becomes your whole over for the rest of your life and the the decadence and the kind of lawlessness and the but also the extreme sense of nature being the most powerful thing of them all was really what stuck with me that people would like you know raise down some giant McMansion that someone had built like three years ago to put another one up and then you go to the person's house and the whole house would be having like flying cockroaches in the house. I remember this one experience that they had this infestation of bugs that was crazy, you know, and so, yeah. So the, what might be seen as the more fantastical elements of your work, yes. that's really just memory. Yes. It's really just childhood very, memory. Very, very much memory. Very <laughs> well, much so. Yeah, yes. That's, that's yes. really interesting. Yeah. Um, but... So then, from there, you moved to actually study religion. Yes. yes. Which is a very interesting move because... Yes. Um, so were either of your parents practicing? So I was, when I was born, my mother was raised Catholic enough to get me secretly baptized Catholic yeah. and not tell my dad because she was worried that if something would have happened to me, I, I wouldn't have Go gone to hell. To, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, um, and then 
my, we, would, we would celebrate both like a big holidays. We'd go, you know, it's church for Christmas and, and definitely do Passover. But then as they got older, they kind of just both got tired of it. <laughs> we didn't do it very much. And then my sister ended up, she's, she actually is a veterinarian in Florida. And so she still is more of a practicing Jew. So we go down and we do Passover sometimes with her family. But, you know, I do say with having children now that I, I definitely see the purpose and, and the idea of an experience that you celebrate something with your family together, it brings in this anchor. And um, my husband is not, I wasn't raised in any kind of religion, so we both kind of said, oh, what are, what are we gonna do and wh what religion are we gonna be part of? And I, I wish that we had some type of link to it in theory, you know, just something. I don't know what it would be, but it's, it makes you um, have this feeling that there's, there's an experience that links you to your past, to, it's again, this historical idea. And I, I think that a lot of things happening now are because people have really lost that worldwide um, link to, to something, you know? To a, to a community that's yes. wider than just, yes. just family, and just your nearest Absolutely. and dearest. And in your, um, in your Miami uh, upbringing, there was obviously also the kind of glamour element. Yes. Right? Yes. So yes. Uh, that must have been pretty strong. You must, it, those light nightclubs must oh, have been was incredibly amazing. glamorous. And then yes. you, you had your own background as a model. Yes. And, and some of your work has taken on the, the, what you might call the glamour industry, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sort of full on. Absolutely. And that's, um, so, so talk a little bit about that sure. and about how you, what, you know, what you felt yeah. you wanted to do with that. That's all that's been changed so much. When I first, um, actually my connection to getting out of Miami, which at the time was very, very provincial and did not have a ballet or, you know, or it had a really cool art, like small art museum at the University of Miami that I saw Dwayne Hansen at, but it was, that was kind of it. And um, I started to do, I was 14 and I was with my mom at a, you know, shopping center and someone's like, oh, your daughter's tall and she could do some modeling. And my mom's like, okay. And it was a way that I started meeting people from New York. I start, I met Bruce Weber. I met, um, you know, oh God, a whole bunch of interesting people back in the day in the 80s, and they were shooting the Calvin Klein Obsession ads and on the top of the Art Deco buildings there, and I, I was just this young, really young girl, and it was really pivotal for me to watch people who were professional people making art in, in this way, that they showed up, they did what they needed to do, and and it and I remember talking to like Bruce, and I was like, I want to move to New York, and he was like, you know, you should apply to college there, get out, and that was, and he ended up introducing me to Robert Miller, who was his dealer at the time, his son Peter, and so it was like this first foray into this cultural world of New York that was I really needed because I did not have that from from Miami and. Um, from my father who was a doctor, my mom a nurse. It was they were they they were like, there's no way you can do that for you know a profession. And and I totally saw these people are doing it. Mm -hmm. I think I could do it. And then I went to um, I went to summer. I lived in for in London for a summer modeling with an agency. And I went to the National Gallery. And then I spent a summer in Milan. And then I did a summer in Paris. And I did a summer in New York. And so all those experiences were like, well, these are big, amazing cities. And I want to be in a big, amazing city, too. And then it was also like very important to me to realize that there's a, you know, Nikki de St. Fall, and um, there's been a lot of interesting connections to female artists who were also fashion models. And this disconnect that you can kind of, your ego and your unconscious are kind of two different things, that, that you become this prop for somebody else and that you can almost disconnect your own ego and go into a really interesting unconscious state, at least I could when I was modeling, because it was, quite frankly, pretty boring, you know, to sit there and just, like, get makeup put on and then, like, stand there. So I would just kind of go into this really weird transcendental state and I realized that there's something about this that's interesting that I think particularly women can do really well, that they can 
take their own spirit out of their body and kind of let it float around a little bit. And, um, and so it's been part of my life too because I pose for my husband, John Curran, and I have been since I was 23 years old when I met him. And I watch myself age through his paintings, which some people ask me, does that upset you? And I'm like, no, I mean, it is what it is. I am, I am now 50 and, and, and it also, is another disconnect for me, which I can see myself as his painting and not as me. And which is quite also wonderful to think about myself going on for the rest of history in that state as well, which is very weird. And, and um, make, working with fashion people, and I did the set for Marc Jacobs, and, and I just did recently this really cool project for Sofia Coppola at the Custom Institute at the Met, where I made the mannequin heads for her period room. If anyone's going to be up at the Met to see the show, it's great. Um, you know, the fashion people and movie people work completely differently than than art people, and I and I like that experience as well. I like seeing that they are of the moment, don't get stuck in the details. It really doesn't matter. And sometimes I think artists get really stuck in the details and they lose the kind of the big picture. So. I've learned a lot from them as well. And, and in, in the beginning, when I first came out in the 90s, you know, everyone told me, absolutely never do anything with fashion people. It's, it, you'll not be looked on kindly as a female artist. It's very, very bad for you. And it's completely different now. You know, the whole world is so different that way. And um, Yeah, there's so much more crossover, isn't yes. there, between all the... Yeah. And you really, you know... I remember I sat with Andre Leontali at a dinner back in the 90s and he was just like, what do you do? And I said, I'm an artist and I was with John. And he said, you both look like you're bankers. Why aren't you wearing like artist clothes? And, and we realized like, you know, in those days, and I remember we, had, we ended up becoming very good friends. And I think it's because there was this idea that artists had to look and act a certain way in society that now just doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. That's absolutely true. Well, I want to ask you how you went from all that to starting to make art. But let's look. I know you've got some oh, more yes, images. Sorry. Let's oh, have goodness. a look. Yes, yes. Um, so this is um, so, from the, yeah. the Maiden Mother Crone oh, look, show. This is wonderful. Yes, so this yeah. is just this big survey of my work, which was a, you know, to have um, a survey show is a, is a pretty big deal because you see there's this room and then there was another room. There were like two different rooms and then there was like two more rooms. It was a very big show. And um, Rizzoli did a beautiful book of, of, of basically all my work starting in like 1993 or 94 was the first, the first piece in, in, the, in the show in the book. And you realize, wow, you see everything all together is a pretty weird experience. It's like, it's like your wedding. You see people that you were in high school with and then like, or in your like, your high school, like kind of carpool within you see people that you're friends with in your contemporary world. So it was very profound, yeah. So this was at the Jewish Museum. It is. In New York. It yeah. is, yeah. Yeah, and um, shows the, the huge range of illusions yeah. you have because I'm right in the front here, we can see uh, the Piero and yes. the, um, the Commedia dell'arte. Exactly. And, yes. um, and then on the other side, that's, that's um, Meissen and Dresden figures, right? It's, it was the Victoria's Secret show from, from Gagosian LA, and, and they're actually made out of resins. We are making them out of porcelain right now oh, through yeah. Nymphenburg, which wow. is very exciting. At that size? No, they're going to yeah. be about 16 inches tall, yeah. so that's still yeah. pretty big. But yeah. yeah, you can't make a certain... We, yeah. I've been working in Maiolica, but even that's pretty hard to get yeah, that size yeah it is. yeah yeah and then then this then the next oh this is also this is this wallpaper that i made for a rome show um and it's a, it was based on mirror paintings of kind of a fake panorama painting and um they were from like flicker images that people took of like tourist images with also old um Panorama paintings from the 1800s, and I made this up, and then I turned it into my own custom-made wallpaper. And then this was this second room. So mm -hmm. Annabelle Seldorf designed the um, the set, I mean the architecture for the whole show, and it was again based on duality. So this room was the the white airy room, and the other side was the dark wet room. So the idea is that your own body is like an example of duality. So if you're right-handed like I am 
my right side is my more like like masculine side and my my dry side and my light side and then the left side is my feminine passive wet side so it's this kind of cool idea of thinking about everything that they need both sides to work so this is the the right side and and I made this custom made white um, piece called Goldstein that's in the back it's kind of a paneled room but it has a funny Miami contemporary um, bourgeois scene with a fa fancy car and then I did all these mirror paintings of um, of older women on the right that I started doing, gosh, when was it? In 2005, I think, yeah. Such a rich, um, uh, a rich display and showing so many things. Now I'd love to bring in our, our audience. If anybody would like to ask uh, Rachel a question, please, sorry to, um, <laughs> but the light's in my eyes. Um, if there's anybody, yes, right at the back. Hey. Hi. I, I love your work. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, this is not a very well thought out question, yeah. but if the Miami you grew up in was not Miami as we know it yes. today, but a place sort of in decay, yes. do you think that that's where you acquired some of your interest in patina and, and sort of yes. decay? Yes, absolutely. Through, absolutely. Through, so through I, I miss the I, I miss Miami the way it was because right. I think that, um, yeah, I think that basically the idea of nature taking over is is a very strong and powerful image and that's what decay is really about as as my son who is a budding artist says basically nature is the ultimate predator like de decay itself is the ultimate predator that it will take over and um, more than a lion or a tiger will you can't stop it and and through time and so i love yes something that was once perfect and beautiful, I, you know, I just I had this really profound moment and we, I, I was lucky enough to get to go to the Met Gala on Monday night because I did these period rooms with Sophia and the best experience about the whole night was walking through the Egyptian tombs and seeing all the sarcophagi and all of the Fayum amazing paintings on the, on the tombs and all these incredibly dressed amazing people walking by and thinking the people in the tombs were doing this just like this in the in the pyramids or you know in their palaces and they were the top layer of their of their whole thing and it's just this profound experience of always feeling all these layers that we're on top of right now that just existed before us so that's why i i really um have a hard time with Miami now is this idea that it's just this all shiny new experience when, you know, there's been a lot of cool stuff that's been there and I, I wish we could remember what that was. You know, it's hard to see with everything else, but it's also great, it's doing so well, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I know that I did. I did. I, I mm -hmm. saw that movie when it first came out and then the original one, I, with, um, who was it? It was the original one, the black and white one. Um, the, uh, yes, the, the, that's Steve McQueen one. But then there was the one that was the super old one. It was like an Ealing Studios one or something yeah, like was. that. Yes. Yes, I think so. I think that's it. I know. It was like I, I had a birthday party with that theme. That's how much I love that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I love the idea of the Met Gala as being a, a giant memento mori. Yes. You know. Yes. Be careful, you will die. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I don't. I don't think it's usually written up like that. <laughs> exactly. I know. It was just so yeah, amazing to the see the most yeah. glamorously dressed people next to all these tombs. Yeah. You know, basically of the most glamorous people yeah. of their time. Of their They're time. in that yeah. incredible tomb because they were the people at the Met Gala of their yes, era. Of you their know, day. yeah. And so much of your work has been about um, challenging notions of beauty. Yes. That, um, and that also must have come, I suppose, from your experiences in the fashion industry mm -hmm. where you had to be perfect, everyone else had to be perfect. Yes. Unreal expectations of, yes. of human beauty, but also of, of plas plasticity of all yeah. sorts. Yes. And um, so tell us, I'm afraid we haven't got very much time left, yeah. but tell us what's next for you. Oh, gosh, I mean, 
I think that um, I've been thinking about this crucifixion sculpture and, and the works that I did recently and how to break them farther down. And I've been very interested. I've always loved Arte Povera and um, especially Pino Pascali was one of my big heroes, but looking at Fontana a lot again, and the idea that Fontana started as a ceramic artist who, who basically would puncture his own sculpture to get to where he became this incredible success story with his punctured canvases. I'm interested in the idea of, um, of just positive and negative space on a, on a, on a more flat plane. Mm -hmm. And I don't really know where that's going. So it's again using this duality thing, but then compressing it to make it a bit more claustrophobic and um, and tighter. And I don't know. It, it, it's always these things where you you as an artist you just you have an, a notion. It's almost like a butterfly kick in your stomach of like a baby or something. You have a feeling like something's there. And sometimes it takes five years or 10 years to come out, but you just keep it in there and you just know it's present and you eventually figured it, figure it out. It really comes out, yeah. And do the ideas drive the choice of material or yes. vice versa? That's what's really cool yeah. and also very your, difficult. Your use of materials yeah. is so varied. Yeah. I mean, how come that you have all yeah. these skills to make all these things? Well, that's or kind of the problem. I mean, yeah. see, the thing yeah. that's interesting, the great thing about being supposedly the left side versus the right side is that you're able to basically scatter your attention elsewhere and you could do multiple things but it makes you not able to focus on the one thing and become famous for doing that one thing so that's been a big thing why I think a lot of female artists haven't been so well known is they just do a lot of different things so using a lot of different materials a lot of different like subject matter sometimes scatters the ideas I believe but but it is who I am and I can't help it and 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 so I think that that's you know, painting is also, as I was saying, it's dealing with this 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 imaginary space on this flat pla flat pla flat plane. So it's very much like a a very much of a spirit experience where you're not in your body when you're looking at a painting. You don't see your own self. You you become like a set of eyes that are just in this incredibly imaginary space. But then a sculpture, you're very aware of the sculpture. You're very aware that it's bigger than you or smaller than you, and that it's it's cold or it's um, or it's dark or it's this or that. And so, I I'm very curious about how to kind of meld those two worlds. And that's what I seem to be going closer and closer towards as I get older. Yeah. That's a very interesting point about um, the lack of kind of instant recognizability for artists, particularly yes. female artists, who use multiple mm -hmm. um, methods mm -hmm. and genres and everything else. Um, but just take us back to tell us how you actually started to make art yeah. after you'd been to college and yes. you'd done theology and yeah. religion. Well, I, I was lucky mm. enough to have incredible, um, an incredible female um, sculptor who was teaching sculpture at Columbia when I was doing religion and philosophy. I actually. I was doing art the whole time, but just secretly. <laughs> like, yeah. So her name is Judy Pfaff. She's an amazing, amazing sculptor. And then she introduced me to Ursula von Riedingsvard and to Kiki Smith. So I had three very powerful, very strong visual like mentors. That Three that, of the best. Yep. Yeah. And that's, that's another thing about starting out when you're young and you have a vision that was formed for when you were younger, but then you need somebody to put it all together for you. And that's, that's absolutely imperative. And, and, and these three women were that for me. So, yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And yeah. wonderful to have such powerful yes. female models, um, yes. role models. That absolutely. Is. Yeah. And I was, I'm lucky enough to still be friends with them. And they come to my show, I go to their show. So it's, it's incredibly important to have that relationship, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. And do you have, are you now mentor to 
Uh, some younger artists. Right now I'm so. like deep in teenage hell, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to get through the yeah. day. <laughs> so but you, I try to be. So I've, you're, you're mentor I've, to I've your had, kids. I've had um, a couple young students yeah. come and in, in, you know, intern at the studio mm -hmm. and, and try mm -hmm. to like, I try to help them out. But right now I'm so in my own, like mm -hmm. own young person's world in my own house. That you have I'm, three, right? Yeah, three I have three. Teenagers. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I had three teenagers, luckily. Oh. I, I'm here to tell you, they grow up. Oh it my gets gosh. better. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm definitely hoping for that end of that day to come. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 gets better, it gets better and better. Um, if there's one last quick question, we could, we could mm -hmm. take that. But... Um, I think that okay. really all that Great. remains is for me yeah. to thank you so much. Thank and thank you. you. Thank you all yeah. for coming. Thank you. That thank was you. really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so generous of you to tell us so much about yourself thank and you. so thoughtfully and eloquently. I really, really, really thank appreciate it. Thank you. I was happy to be yeah. here. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>